Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. When I was in South Africa in the early 80s, 1980s, I was invited to visit the pastor and activist Bears Naude. I had to go to his home since he was under banning orders from the apartheid South African government. It was a, a form of house arrest. Further, under the terms of the ban, Pastor Naude was not permitted to meet with more than one person at a time, and so we had to meet outside in his garden to satisfy whoever had him under surveillance at the time. I don't know what I was expecting from this man who had been exiled from his own white Afrikaner people, who had been cast out of his white supremacist denomination, who had been arrested and jailed, ostracized and marginalized, and was now in the middle of his multiple year sentence of house arrest. I don't know what I was expecting, but who I found was a gentle, thoughtful, firm, and faithful person who to my 25-year-old self <clears throat> seemed to embody the kind of human being that I inspired, aspired to be, and perhaps embodied the kind of person that I pictured Jesus to have been. In the course of our conversation, I asked Bears Nadea a lot of dumb, naive questions, which thankfully I've forgotten. <laughs> but when I asked what had moved him to leave behind his conservative religious tradition and his family and his friends, he answered three things. I read the Bible. I read the Bible, and I really read it, and I took it to heart. What does it mean to preach good news to the poor and freedom to the oppressed? He said, I started to pay attention to the things that were going on all around me instead of ignoring them. And I started paying attention to the Spirit of God telling me to tell the truth. And what happened, he said, what happened was a kind of miracle. I can't think about this passage from the Gospel of Luke, the story of Jesus reading from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, without thinking of those moments in the garden with Pastor Nade. Here in the Gospel, we see Jesus reading the Bible, really reading it, taking it to heart and applying it to himself. We see Jesus keenly aware of what was going on around him, the suffering of the poor and the oppressed, the marginalized and the ostracized. And we see Jesus always, always moving in the power of the Spirit of God, always moving in the power and presence of the Spirit of God. And so as we start this morning, I would like to introduce you to Jesus. I know you know Jesus. But so much gets said about Jesus that has nothing to do with Jesus that I think it's helpful from time to time to get a fresh introduction to Jesus. Each of the Gospel writers want to introduce us to Jesus in a bit of a different way. John as we saw last week, wants us to know Jesus as the miracle maker, the doer of signs. And so John starts the gospel with Jesus at a wedding, turning water into wine, lots of wine, so the party can keep going. Luke also starts with a miracle, but it's a very different kind of miracle the kind of miracle that happens when you take the words of Scripture as your own, when you take Scripture to heart. The kind of miracle that happens when a faithful person comes to accept the freedom and the power God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms 
they present themselves as we promise in our baptismal vows. Luke wants us to know that Jesus, that he knows. Jesus the prophet, the young and fearless prophet we just sang about. The Jesus who came to topple the tables to tell prophetic stories that turned the established order not upside down, but right side up. And so here in Luke, we see Jesus at the beginning of his ministry connecting with the Jewish prophetic tradition and connecting with the spirit of a liberating God and inviting us to connect with that spirit as well. Jesus came to Galilee in the power of the spirit, says Luke. At last Thursday's Bible study, Karen and Ekema began by asking us to reflect on the statement, I am powerful. Some shared that it was hard to identify with that statement because they they did not feel powerful or because it was hard to own the power that they have. But it's a true statement. You are powerful. You are. You have power. We have power. We have the power to change things, to do things, to be things. The trick for us is sometimes to embrace the power that we have. Jesus comes to Galilee embracing his power. Why? Because he comes in the power of the Spirit. It's not the kind of power that comes from intimidating and manipulating people who we perceive to be weaker than we are. The power of the Spirit is the power to challenge those who believe themselves to hold power over others and to challenge them in the name of the source of true power. The source of true power. And so Jesus comes in the power of the Spirit, and he comes to his hometown synagogue, and there he reads words of power from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because God has anointed me to preach good news to those who are poor. God has sent me to proclaim release to those held captives and recovery of sight to those who are blind, to set free the oppressed and to proclaim a year of liberation. And then Jesus does a funny thing. He sits down and he says a funny thing. Today, this scripture is being fulfilled in your hearing. In your hearing. I've thought a lot about that phrase. What I think is happening here is that Jesus is challenging himself and challenging those hometown folks and probably us too to live into those words of Isaiah, to claim our spiritual power to bring a word of good news to people who have heard a lot of bad news, to participate in the process of liberation, to turn things not upside down, but right side up. That's the way the scripture comes to be fulfilled. That's the miracle. That's the miracle. So let's spend just a moment looking at the five things that God is anointing Isaiah and Jesus and us to do. Preach good news to those who are materially poor. Frederick Buechner once described preaching as telling the truth. Nothing more than telling the truth and nothing less. And telling the truth to those who find themselves economically poor necessitates first and foremost uh, contradicting and contracting the lie that our culture has embraced. The lie that if you're poor, it's your fault. Our church member Benz wrote an article this week about the news coverage of the Bronx fire and how easily and quickly well-respected media outlets focused on blaming the victims of the fire. Somebody used a defective space heater. Oh, Oh yes, the heating system in 
the building was unreliable. Someone fleeing the fire did not shut the door behind them. Oh yes, the doors are supposed to shut automatically, but they malfunctioned. And yes, the building had a lot of violations, but nobody seemed to want to name the wealthy and powerful violators. Hmm. Telling the truth to anyone who will listen is a powerful way to live up to the anointing of God's Spirit. Let's tell the truth. Number two, proclaim release to the captives. So many of us are captive to so many things in so many ways. At Thursday's Bible study, we spent a lot of time considering the crushing problem of debt, student debt, incurred by those who took the challenge of pursuing education under a system that's not funded in the way that other developed nations do. Medical debt incurred through no fault of the family crushed by it, and so on and so forth. What would our society look like, be like, if we were going to undertake the biblical pattern of releasing debt and obligation and servitude every seven years to provide a fresh start and a second chance for people to participate more fully in our economy and our common life? What would it look like? Number three, recovery of sight to those who are blind. You know, Jesus is a restorer of sight, and yes, he works to restore sight to those who are physically blind, sometimes causing a cult controversy in a culture that believed that blindness was some sort of punishment for sin. And Jesus works to cure spiritual blindness as well. The blindness caused by fear, the blindness caused by our ignorance, the blindness caused by greed and selfishness, and the blindness caused by deliberate lies and misinformation. I sometimes feel that it's so difficult struggling with spiritual blindness, too difficult, especially in such a, a charged political climate where truth is hard to come by and harder to convince people of. But that doesn't mean we don't try. It doesn't mean we don't try. We just sang about the summons of Jesus for us to stand with humble courage for truth, with hearts uncowed. And we're about to sing and ask God to open our eyes to those glimpses of truth, open our ears to hear voices of truth that God sends so clear. And while the wave notes fall on our ears, everything falls will disappear. God, let it be so. Let us be a truth-telling community of truth-tellers. Four, let the oppressed go free. I think we have witnessed a shift in the discussion around mass incarceration and police violence in the last year or two with a, a rising crime rate, real and perceived. But we can't insist on an approach to criminal justice that just sends us back to the old racist and classist solutions. We can't do that. Which brings us to number five. Proclaim the year of God's favor. The year of God's favor, the year of freedom, the year of fresh, of fresh start, the year of liberation. What if we claim that this is indeed a new year? A really new year, a year of looking at things in a fresh and free and less jaundiced way. And then maybe we would find the world changing and our lives changing in the power of the Spirit. Now I began by telling you about somebody I met 40 years ago who seemed so old at the time and at that time was about my age now. This person I met 40 years ago when I was young, somebody who, in his way of embracing scripture as his own calling, his ability to look around him with a fresh vision, not clouded by 
false narratives of superiority, his gentle willingness to give up privilege for a different kind of power. This person struck me as the kind of person I would hope to be, I would like to be. To be honest, I'm still working on that. But my prayer for each of us today is to hear the words of scripture, those prophetic words of the prophet Isaiah as embraced by the young and fearless prophet from Galilee as our own summons, our own calling to be good news to the poor and marginalized, to ostracized and the trivialized, and to embody and live in and move in the power of the Spirit of God, the power that comes from insisting on the truth, the power that comes from telling the truth. May it be so.